be focusing on analysis and tools and mission before. We're going to start ours to do a brief introduction in the moderators, which I've just done. And then we're going to go into our preamble presentation, which is similar to what you just heard from format that you heard from uh, Anthony and Mike in the previous session. Uh, the presenters from the ANVIL team will be uh, Dr. Vincent Gray, Dr. Anna O'Donnell Luria. Um, and we will then go into our discussions. And then from our, our, our the, um, once those discussions are completed, we'll start working on a breakout report. So I'm gonna give some more information about the discussions so you know we're all on the same page. So for this session, we also have discussants for this group, for this session as shown here. Um, so I want to thank all of you for being discussants um, and providing um, the opportunity to share your thoughts for the group. Um, in regards to the discussion topics, we're going to take, as Valentina mentioned, we're going to take the uh, a SWOT uh, method for uh, developing um, the breakout reports for this uh, topic. Uh, so we're going to address the strengths of the ANVIL, where does the ANVIL excel, weaknesses, where does ANVIL, where does ANVIL have a disadvantage, and opportunities where ANVIL can grow and improve, as well as identify threats are those things that, but those factors that jeopardize ANVIL. Uh, as mentioned in Valentina's opening presentation, there's going to be three cross-cutting themes that we want to incorporate in our discussions. Those will include the cloud use, what's needed for cloud-based systems to better meet the needs of the genomics community, uh, what tools or services would better support the clinical genomics research community, as well as understanding what does ANVIL need to do to improve interoperability with other genomic resources in a federated ecosystem. Um, to help stimulate an engaging and respectful uh, discussion, uh, we have a few guide rules and so for, for, uh, our, for the attendees. Um, right now, the attendees were all automatically muted, but you're free to unmute yourself. Uh, the moderator will initially solicit comments from the discussants about the ANVIL's uh, SWAT, uh, but then open it up for other participants. Uh, questions and comments uh, you can put in the Zoom, and the feature you can use raise your hands, or and the moderator will call on you. And there's also an opportunity to provide comments and ideas in the notes section. Um, and so if I can, and I think we put in the, I'll put in the chat real quick after here the link to Yes, yeah, so if you look in the chat, you'll see the direct link to the comment section for this particular topic. Um, so feel free to uh, provide any ideas that you have, and that's in, in, on that Google Sheet. Um, for the social engagement, don't be shy from identifying problems and risks. This is really a, a sense for us to understand what we think will work and what will not work going forward for the ANVIL. Uh, please feel free to be candid you, and you will be heard and be please, and as always, we're all going to be polite. Um, if you're a talker, please remember to give others the time and space to talk. And if you are quiet, take advantage of any opening when, the, when those opportunities present themselves. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Or we have analysts also if you have any concerns. So this is basically the format that will show um, uh, the, for, our, for the different components of the SWATs. And I will turn this over to Dr. Marilyn Ritchie, who will start up as our as our, uh, start up our session. And I will stop sharing my screen. Marilyn. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. So thank you, Ken, for that introduction. I thought that was really helpful. So as Ken indicated, what we want to do is go through this SWOT analysis. We have uh, before that a presentation from. Um, let's see, who's going to give the presentation? Um, so we have. Dr. Vincent Gray and Dr. Ann O'Donnell Luria. So, which one of you want to start? I'll be starting. Okay. Vince Gray, thank you. Uh, shall I share screen then? That would be great. Okay. So, be keeping the SWAT in mind as you're listening to this presentation. And then, once we hear those, we'll start the discussion. All right. Uh, and then we'll present here. And I'll be presenting all the slides. And when I transition over to uh, Dr. O'Donnell Luria, then she will tell me when to advance the slides. So thank you all for coming. Um, this is a discussion of analysis tools. Is it looking okay? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, good. Um, so the basic roadmap is uh, I'll be telling you uh, some of the details of the core components. And uh, then Anne will take over uh, and discuss basic science and, and clinical science aspects of work on the ANVIL. And then uh, it'll probably come back to me to talk about some of the issues of extending it from a technical point of view. 
So we've already seen this display that uh, security perimeter for genomics, interactive genomics, collaborative genomics uh, is very important. And um, really just this year, uh, this certification has been achieved and allows developers in different spaces related to genomic computing to provide their tools to the community in a secure way. And you've heard already mention of, of Bioconductor and Galaxy as tools, uh, this one for individuals who are really not doing any programming at all, but still setting up uh, genomic workflows. And this one uh, a little more in the interactive computing and programming and even packaging uh, space. And then in terms of workflows uh, that can be managed and distributed and reused, DocStore uh, is an important component of the Anvil. And the numbers of resources available to users in these different spaces, which we'll say a little bit more uh, about shortly, um, is very substantial. This is a, split, a, a layout of the components, again, uh, suggested by Fred Tan, that there are two dimensions that we should think about, basic science to clinical and large scale batch computing to interactive. And the different components can be laid out in this space uh, from those that are very large scale workflow to command line or interaction. And the consortia that have been leveraging these tools, uh, specifically telomere to telomere and pan genome project, and then the clinical dimensions uh, that can be worked on that Anne will be telling you more about. Terra is the basic cloud computing platform that we're using right now, and it's composed of workspaces. And workspaces are a, a very user-friendly device for getting people into cloud computing. So the dashboard of a workspace can have a long prose and, and graphical display discussion of, of what you can do the data component is a set of tables that really describe from a metadata point of view, the types of things that can be used in the workspace, the types of data. And then you can have Jupyter notebooks or R markdown documents, workflows in the workflow description language and the history of all the workflows that have been run are all unified for a given task topic and cloud environments can be defined that involve clusters or single multi-core machines, what have you. Uh, in order to do the work that you want to do. And these workspaces, uh, there are many, as we've already noted, there are featured examples of workspaces that people can immediately copy to get rolling in one or another domain. Our studio and bioconductor we mentioned a number of times, they basically work in the most familiar way you could imagine. You come on, you fire up our studio, and then you can bring in data or work with the data from the Anvil uh, immediately. Um, and this is a tested R Studio environment, and we keep up uh, with it to have the latest bioconductor releases always available. Galaxy is specifically for individuals with no programming expertise to compose workflows and to work with a very large community and lots of curated data and many, many tools. It's right there, it's ready to go. So, those are the tools that. Um, are available, and I'll talk at the end about extensibility. I want to turn it over to Anne now to discuss uh, some of the clinical applications. Great, thanks so much, Vince. Um, so there's a lot going on. We've heard a lot in science about the telomere to telomere transition or telomere, telomere analysis, um, um, including people who are in this call today. And so this is a great example of some exciting workflows in the scientific field that a lot of people are going to want to access. And definitely with a lot of big data like this, we don't want to be reproducing it in individual sites. So this is workflow has been set up so others can run the T to T analysis workflow here. Um, and then on the next slide, we have an example from the SHOTS lab that um, Drs. Miga and Philippi on this call and probably others on this call were also involved in this paper. So reanalyzing a large number of diverse or a large number of human genomes from diverse ancestries um, from, and trying to look at how we can change variant calling. And what this is showing us is we're getting a lot more accurate variant calling when we use the T to T uh, assembly. And so from this, they were able to both increase the number of interesting variants found, but also decrease the number of total variants um, because there's a lot cleaner assembly. A lot of the duplicated regions have been much better resolved. 
Um, in addition, there are, they, the paper finds that 269 medically relevant genes where there are disease associations, they had a 12-fold improvement in calling variants in those genes. So there's a class of genes that are going to be hard from the original GRCH 38 and 37 um, and short read sequencing data to be able to analyze. And so this is going to be an important improvement for analyzing those genes. Can we move on to the next slide? Uh, so this is the one of the platforms I work on and where I'm the most comfortable sharing information, but it's uh, Seeker is an open source software for really focused in the rare disease and Mendelian analysis space. Um, and this is a tool we've been able to bring onto Anvil so that any researcher now can go and put their joint BCF in a Terra workspace and push a button to get their data loaded up into Seeker. And so it's, it really like deeply annotates it. It lets you see read data. It, has, it brings in lots of outside data sets. Like you can look at DTEX in there or, or um, link out to a bunch of things. And it's also a matchmaker exchange node so that you can actually um, submit candidate genes and, and match with other researchers. So again, all available um, on Anvil now. And we have a lot of exciting development um, plans for the future, including bringing a lot of different variant types in. But the one thing I did want to mention as like a, a potential possibility is I think it would be really great in the field to have more of a, I have a cram, I put it in Anvil and I push a button and it takes me through all the workflows to generate all the different types of variants into thinking about uh, and, to, and then to, into loading to Seeker to really like empower the clinician and researcher to be able to take it from part, part one into the future. But, um, next slide. And PRS scores, polygenic risk scores. Um, there have been an, there are Jupyter notebooks now that has set up a lot of these nice workflow analyses, so you can come in and analyze your data sets. And then we've already heard about these interactive reports that can be generated um, right in the Anvil to to um, to help share this information from the polygenic risk scores in ways that have been studied very well in terms of maximizing the communication ability of this information. Um, so next slide. So the AHA and ANVIL working group has thought a lot about what kind of features does the clinical genetics and particularly for cardiac disease do we need? And they interviewed a panel of scientists and um, PRS scores from the, the prior are one of the things that was really noted as a, a large need here along with pharmacogenetics. Um, and so while some of it is set up, there's a lot of different method development in the PRS space. And so bringing additional um, workflows and additional methods into Anvil is going to really be important to continue to empower this community. Um, and this group put together a list of 17 tools that they thought were kind of the, the leading edge in, in PRS. Um, and additionally, over the past year, um, Dr. Casey Overby-Taylor has led focus groups to discuss resources for pharmacogenetics. And we move into the next slide. And here we're... Um, Hello. <laughs> Here we're talking about um, FarmCat, um, so doctor, a tool that Dr. Ritchie has been involved in or leading um, for clinical genomics in the pharmacogenomics space to really support clinical decision making. So this is coming really soon in the next month or so, hopefully. Um, and the idea here is that um, the, because of just for people who don't know that because of how star alleles um, are often defined as kind of a different nomenclature, we need tools that can take genomic data, transfer it into the the type of variants that we use here, and then guide through medical decision making. And so the FarmCat tool kind of takes you end to end on that, and it's going to be a really great resource for the community. And next slide, and I will hand it back to Vince. Well, thanks very much. Um, the last points we want to raise here concern the future of Anvil in terms of technical capabilities conferred on developers outside the immediate technical group to bring new tools into the space. And so by registering tools in DocStore or uploading Whittles into your own workspaces, you extend the capabilities of Anvil computational genomics. You can also use the Anvil APIs or extensions uh, or repurposing of those in other languages um, to use any of the components of the Anvil. Um, and this is all done in a very standardized way with the open API or swagger uh, techniques for um, con conveying services to client users. And wrapper libraries in Python and R uh, are working now and programmers who know how to take advantage of these can build new resources for use in genomic analysis. Uh, and then adding new web applications containerized using Kubernetes 
this is all doable now. Um, finally, there's this idea that third-party applications uh, can be run uh, and security protocols for these uh, are being formulated now. So the idea is that you wouldn't even have to go into a workspace necessarily, but all the authentication and so forth would be taken care of by an app that is able to use the Anvil. Uh, there's also work now to bring more machine learning uh, uh, methodology and to use uh, GPUs that are available in the various cloud providers uh, to carry out uh, this type of learning. Uh, basic science work to uh, ensure that individuals have access to all of the results of ENCODE, Roadmap, IGVF, and, and GTEC, and so forth, all inside the platform ready to be interrogated. And as has been mentioned, new work in clinical genomics, extending the usability of eMERGE, and uh, all the tools that can be uh, deployed in order to deal with the uh, genetics uh, questions. And I think that is the last slide. Yeah, so thank you very much. I think I will stop sharing now. Or maybe I should leave the slides up in case there are any questions about them. Well, maybe we should do that just briefly. Are there any questions for, for Vincent or Anne before we get into the SWOT analysis? Uh, just wondering if there are any timelines for some of these, uh, specifically like the integration of the ENCODE roadmap data. We've been in discussion with ENCODE. Um, their total data footprint, if I recall, is about one and a half petabytes. And today it's in, in started in AWS. I think right. there's, um, it'll come in phases. So the first phase is kind of mirror the data in GCP. And we've actually started you know, working towards that. Um, but that will, but you know, but that'll just sort of be raw access, and then over time, we'll kind of build out more and more sophisticated capabilities uh, to doing so. So that's kind of underway right now. Roadmap, um, we've, we've we've only just sort of really just started the discussion there, so that'll be a, a more extended um, timeline for that. Yeah, roadmap's built into the encode portal, so if you push ah, right, right. it, you, you just get it by default. Yeah, that's right. You're right. Just the, the reason I mention it is because ENCODE is ending up and, and we're trying to write up papers and stuff. And one of the issues that we're having is like, there is no home for models and analysis tools. Like the portal and stuff is really designed primarily for the data. And we've been playing with Anvil and actually it is fantastic. Like everything we've tried just works out of the box. And the only thing that's missing is that is the ENCODE data itself. So like if that could be brought in, then actually it would be a fantastic potential showcase for Anvil. Like when we publish these papers next year, like all the toolkits could be really exposed through Anvil and all the data would be at the portal or in the cloud. And so I'm just kind of mentioning that as a potential, uh, very interesting collaboration. So. Excellent, let's do it. Yeah. That sounds like low hanging fruit, quick win. So yes. great idea. <laughs> All right, so why don't we transition? I think we're one minute behind schedule, not according to the timer, but according to the original agenda. Um, so we're gonna go through the SWOT analysis and Ken is gonna um, help put our slides together. Ken, are you just gonna type in them and we'll just talk through or were you gonna share them as you type? So my plan is to let you first just have your discussions and I'm gonna take the key points from it. And then in the last 10 minutes, I'm gonna put them all together and then we can see if, if I said, if I transcribe them correctly, and if I did them in the right order. <laughs> Sounds great. Okay. All right, so our goal here is to try to spend about 10 minutes on each, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So let's start with strengths. Um, and the goal is to hear from the discussants first. So those of you who are identified on the slide, if you could um, feel free to, to contribute first, that would be great. And uh, we can do it two ways. One, you can use the raise hand feature, which you just hit reactions, and which is on the bottom of your Zoom screen and hit raise hand and I'll call on you. Or if you wanna type them into the chat, that's fine as well. Um, and so Luke, I see that you have a question typed in there. Um, I'll go ahead and, and just ask it for you while others uh, are, are formulate their, their points. Um, so the, a question that Luke raises, if there were restrictions on programming languages for third-party applications, I think that is an important one that may fall into a, a weakness if there are restrictions. 
Yeah, I'll, 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 I can address this. So there's, you know, as you just heard about, there's, you know, there's several different entry points into the Anvil sort of analysis suite, uh, depending on what you want to do. You know, one, one sort of key distinction is this, is this going to be something you're going to do, you know, in a workflow at very large scales, or is this something that needs to be run more interactively? Our, our sort of um, preferred environment for very large scale uh, workflows uses something, is something called Whittles, the workflow description language. In my mind, it's like, I'm teasing a little bit. This is like a very fancy bash script in the sense that you set up here are the command lines that, that need to run, here are the inputs, here are the outputs. So anything that you can execute in a bash script can be run. That can be in Python and C, Java, Rust, kind of you name it. So it's, it's quite um, universal at that level. And then the amazing thing is that you know, behind the scenes, there's a lot of technology. There, there's something um, called Cromwell that if you need you know, 10,000 cores, it'll just sort of orchestrate those machines and orchestrate the data on, in and out. So if you need to scale up a workflow in any language, that's you know, a, an opportunity. At the other extreme are more interactive tools. Um, you know, if you want to, you know, if, if it's just a matter of a few parameters you need to set, maybe that would be a good choice in Galaxy. If there's a very like sophisticated user interface where you need like custom visualizations, that's where that new Kubernetes technology um, is really important, where you can kind of package up an entire web server with whatever GUI you want, and then it can be launched and, and deployed in the environment. Today, that's how we're using, that's how we um, deploy Galaxy is in that Kubernetes environment. It's very feature rich. It sets up. You know, web servers, proxies, databases, there's a whole cluster behind the scenes. So, you, you know, the sky's the limit as to what is possible. Although obviously if it's more complicated, it just requires more engineering uh, to make it so. Thanks, Michael. All right, so does anyone want to go first with strengths? Anshul, I was just about to pick on you since you already spoke up that it's been great. So please go ahead. Yeah, so um, we've been very, very pleasantly surprised with, like we thought we'd have lots of teething problems. I mean, we work really with uh, a lot of these deep learning frameworks and libraries and like um, data sets that aren't like necessarily currently the primary product in Anvil, which is variation data. We're primarily working with molecular data <clears throat> and everything has really just beautifully worked out of the box. In fact, I would say, uh, we were struggling to scale things up, uh, partly because like we're running these models on thousands of data sets and like, you know, scheduling the right machines and moving data around and all of that stuff. The fact that Anvil is taking care of all of that or Terra or whatever is under the hood is just unbelievable. Like you can specify, I mean, you know, and one of my postdocs, like he spent maybe two days and he was completely up to speed. Like he got, got all of it working. So I, I would just say like, whatever you guys are doing in terms of documentation and you know uh the, the way it's set up is just um is really quite spectacular i don't think we've ever like even just learning google cloud took us like weeks but like jumping into annual took like maybe two or three days so i would just say that's a real big plus for you that's great um barbara yeah, um, my experience uh, in uh, infrastructure like this is from GTEx mostly, I guess. And um, uh, when we were working with GTEx V8, we um, were told that we had to take the data on Google Cloud and download it. You know, back of the envelope calculation was like 20K for downloading it and, and storing it on our local uh, system. Um, so the fact that all of this is kind of done is, is just amazing. And I totally agree with Anshul. I think um, the fact that it's, it seems fairly easy to spin up from, from nothing uh, to work on these data is so much better than what we had before. So I really appreciate all of that. Um, I, I have to say another thing that I feel like we, we do a lot internally is work really hard on, you know, getting these servers that are, that are uh, protecting the uh, uh, sensitive data and the fact that this is kind of done under the hood, uh, the accesses are, are managed appropriately, uh, really saves us a lot of justification um, for, you know, I mean, we all do this a thousand times in a thousand different places and sort of having one place where it's done, I think would be amazing. Yeah, great points. Um, Karen? Hi, just speaking on behalf of uh, my team, I'm team American Consortium colleagues and really emphasizing how useful Anvil was for our variant team in particular, as highlighted in the presentation by Anne and also by Mike Schatz's team who was running, who was the co-lead of that variant part of our working group. That has just been tremendous in building workflows. And a lot of the conversations that I've been having um, kind of past that paper is how to utilize short read data sets against this new reference and how to 
develop even more tools in the space. So it was really a lovely way to to really showcase the strengths of Anvil in the use of this new reference. Also, many of our other working groups, such as the one that I lead, such as the Centromeric Satellite Annotation Work, we're now using Whittle workflows and moving everything onto Terra and making sure that we have more tooling um, on the Anvil platform. And this is not for our telomere to telomere consortium per se, but this is to move into more reference genomes, more in that basic science space of trying to improve um, annotation work in, in human pan genome reference consortium. So it's just been a, a really tremendous resource. We have a lot of education and outreach programs kind of in place here at UC Santa Cruz through our computational genomics laboratory led by Beth Sheets. And so we're trying to really utilize these workflows that have been established in 2021 and use uh, work workshops through um, ASHG and other ways to kind of showcase that and, and collect information on our end because we've just had such tremendous uh, use of ANVIL. Great, thank you for that. We have maybe one or two minutes left on strengths in terms of the analysis tools in ANVIL. Does anyone else want to comment before we move on to weaknesses? Luke. I'm not a discussant. Is it okay for other non discussants Okay. Thank it's you. okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say for the, the third-party extensibility, the fact that you have planned from an infrastructure standpoint to allow for third-party applications to extend the system is beautiful. And not only are you allowing for these endpoints to take place, you have very clear in the, in the background material, very clear instructions for putting security first. Um, enabling and empowering developers. Um, and I also want to applaud you for having a maintenance and user support because sustainability right, is, a, is a big issue. Thank you. Tim? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, you know, one thing I've loved, I mean, so some I'm often thinking in terms of like interactive environments. First of all, thank you for setting all those up and it's been great. Um, it's also wonderful you guys have all of the like kernels already built with, you know, updated R and everything like that. I mean, the amount of time I have to spend convincing sysadmins here to keep that stuff up to date. Uh, it's nice to have just one, one group doing that well, as opposed to fighting lots of groups to get that done. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, I would second that. All right. So why don't we move on to weaknesses? So um, with the, the tools that that have been shown both in the background materials and also in the presentation this morning. Um, did anyone identify any weaknesses in what's currently there? Anshul. So this is not really, these are, these are not really weaknesses, but more like wish lists. So I, I'm, I'm glad the, the topic of the model zoo came up because in my ideal world, I would have like the data, the code and visualization tools and a model zoo kind of all encompassed in the same cloud. So I, I'm glad to see that that's potentially working and I'd love to brainstorm more on those aspects. Um, the second thing is, I think alongside these uh, standardized data sets coming from um, consortia, which are a major source of data, there are additional efforts, you know, like recount to which many of you are involved in, of course, and, you know, Systrom DB and so forth that are uniformly processed, like all of the data on geo which is also an amazing resource. And it'd be good to do some outreach and try to see if those teams would be able to kind of create portals for those data sets. So those aren't like technically consortia, but they are really bringing the power of all public data. And most of it is, is basically open access, at least the, the versions of the data that exist there. So that I think would be very nice too. And of course, thirdly, um, I, I didn't specifically see any plans for incorporating a lot of the single cell data from many of those consortia, you know, HubMap, HTAN, and so forth. That's obviously slightly more difficult, but just wanted to recommend that that hopefully is on the timeline plan as well. Thank you for those comments. To, to, so I, you know, I agree, Model Zoo is really important. I'm, I'm, I'm kicking myself that you brought up Recount3. That is one of the groups that we've been outreaching to. Um, they have a workspace, they're loading their data into it right now. So I, I think that'll be available um, hopefully by the end of this year. And then I agree, single cell is an important dimension. You know, this part of the complexity is just, you know, there's so many uh, different teams we want to work with and we just had to prioritize. So we started, you know, primarily with, you know, kind of large scale WGS data, but now that those pipelines are in place, absolutely, we're looking to other different, other types of data and single cell is definitely on our roadmap for things of interest. 
So I just remember one more quick thing, if I can just say, um, I think it'd be awesome to have an outreach group that like hooks into the data coordination centers of all of these consortia, because I think if they inherently incorporate Anvil as one of their primary platforms, it will just make everything better. Yeah. They, they, they'll, it's often is a lot of fractionation and Anvil could be one of those strategies of bringing all of it, all of it back, like inherently supporting Anvil as part of their DCCs. That could be, I think, really nice. That, that's, this, part, that's definitely part of our strategy. We, we've reached out to DCCs at IGVF, Gregor, um, uh, I'm drawing a blanker, you know, CCDG, CMGs, you know, all, all of these okay, great. Great. We're doing it already. Right. Fantastic. We got to do a better job yeah. with them. Awesome. Sid, why don't we make sure that that ends up in your session this afternoon on outreach and training, just to make sure that's an opportunity, I think, that would be, uh, it sounds like one that you're already doing, Mike, but, what, but one that is fruitful and, and something the group should keep doing. Um, Sid, do you want to go ahead? Uh, you had something to say? Uh, yeah, yeah. I just, I just want, um, especially now just to chime in on what Mike was talking about before. Uh, I'm not a discussant. I'm on the external consulting committee. Um, but Mike, if you could give um, a little bit more of the uh, detailed history about the previous ingestions, I think that might be helpful in how you described in detail what you're doing currently, um, yeah, briefly. Um, okay, I mean, the, the whole other parallel uh, breakout session was about this, so I'll give you maybe the, the 30 second version. <laughs> um, you know, it kind of started with our kind of local collaborators, you know, we're kind of with data types that we knew really well. Um, specifically, really, I think, you know, arguably it started with CCDG. Um, CCDG is a very large project with hundreds of thousands of genomes, but it's organized into like different cohorts. And importantly, each cohort has, you know, uh, certain um, uh, credentials that are necessary, certain sort of, um, uh, 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 you know, restrictions on who can access those data. Um, and then there's sort of the umbrella project that it works in. So we kind of did it cohort by cohort where, you know, you work with the DCC to adjust it. There's pipelines built up um, to, har to sort of harmonize it, do QC, uh, populate the workspaces. And now that those workspaces are populated am amongst the individual cohorts, now we can do kind of the meta-analysis where we do joint coin and, uh, calling across those. Um, but more broadly, you know, um, we're, 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 we're kind of doing um, uh, actively sort of outreaching to groups that we're interested to work with. And then also, if you look at NHGRI, they're starting to write into RFAs that, you know, this new consortium is, you know, is, you know, strongly encouraged to talk to the Anvil to, you know, talk about how that interaction could work. So it's kind of going both ways. Some of this is coming top down from NHGRI, and we're also doing a bottom-up approach where we're reaching out to individual consortiums to try to make them aware and try to support them um, get onboarded. Thank you, Michael. Karen? I just have a very brief comment. Um, based on our team here at UC Santa Cruz, it sounds like there could be some improvement with documentation of, of Anvil organization using DocStore. It seems like there's a lot of information on us, our side kind of building up DocStore, and maybe that could be an improved um, place for us to have engagement with Anvil. Great, thank you. And Tim? Hey, yeah, my comment might be along similar lines. I, I love that you guys um, have an opportunity to, to sort of share workflows across groups and publish workflows. Um, but like right now, for example, I tried to search for some. There's 2,000 methods and there's a simple filter bar. And so it's really hard to find what other people have done. And um, I think it was the same with DocStore. It's, you know, there's lots of facets, but, but they're not the facets that tell me what it does in some ways, right? Um, and so I think if, you know, I think it's a really hard problem, absolutely a hard problem, but, you know, the more that there's ways to sort of curate, organize, um, sort of present the workflows that are out there in, in some sort of way that help people with certain analytical goals in mind kind of get to some list of tools that'll help them, uh, I think making that easier would be, would be helpful for a lot of people. I'm wondering what, what folks think about the tools that are currently there in the clinical genomics or genomic medicine space and whether there are things that are missing that, that the team should be thinking about there. Barbara? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think I think there's a lot of methods that I would really be excited to see there on uh, the interpretation of uh, these SNPs or to the mechanistic interpretation. So I, I, I just like to throw out one that my group uses all the time, you know, we love LDSC and, um, you know, having all those annotations there uh, to start understanding what's going on would be great, but others like co-localization analyses, um, 
uh, any of the uh, mediation um, and dealing randomization ones, I think would be really great to start um, to start understanding mechanism. I'd, I'd be really excited to see those. Great suggestions. I agree with all of those. And what about any related to, so I noticed on the future directions, one of the, the future directions in terms of um, data that may, may be ingested, especially because of eMERGE, is some of the electronic medical record data. Obviously, it won't be a dump of the full EHR, but my assumption is that it will be something like tables from OMOP or something like that, since eMERGE is using OMOP uh, as the data model. Are there tools that, that folks can think of that if there were some OMOP data tables there, for example, that, that you would want to see there um, so that users could use for doing, you know, clinical genetic or clinical genomic um, linkage with the EMR? I guess I'll throw out one that I thought about, although I'm, I'm looking at uh, Chunwa and George. I can't believe you don't have any suggestions. Uh, oh, George will, okay, good. But one thing that um, I actually was just emailing with Ken about this and Michael this week, um, you know, we're developing different EHR phenotype algorithms and the phenotype knowledge base is a common place to put these rule-based algorithms. But it did occur to me that in the future, if some of the data for some of you know some medical record data is in Anvil, being able to put these rule-based algorithms and deploy them in Anvil, I think you know could be really useful. Right now, what happens is that you kind of put the algorithm into FeeKB and then folks download it and rebuild it within their system. But that might be a future space if there are data tables there of things like diagnosis codes and labs um, or uh, procedure codes or things like that. Uh, being able to take algorithms that are in FKB and deploy them in Anvil might be a future use that would be useful. It's certainly not there now. And uh, George, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, so I can offer to you guys what kind of tools would be available, say, from the Odyssey Initiative for processing clinical data um, and how it might align. I mean, we're going through this, obviously, for all of us research program. Anthony's not on this session, but he's, you know, uh, has OMOP on one side and he has the uh, um, the genomic data on the other side. How do you pull it? It's mostly Jupyter Notebooks over there and OMOP related tools on the other side. So, I mean, I'd be happy to spend time off off time night run that right the second going over what the possibilities would be there. It's based on R and R. It, it, so it's all based on R. I think it fits in very well with what you've already done. Um, uh, but there are some special purpose stack tools that are, have their own user interface. So, you know, depends on how sophisticated a clinical analysis they're going to do on the data in Anvil. But if we look forward, we're talking about the future of Anvil, not the current state. So we're talking about the future. There may be an increasing amount of clinical data. And I think we have, um, like if you have 100 million patients with a million variables per patient, I mean, these are the tools you use to do that. SPSS, SAS, none of that works when you have 100 million by a million. It exploits the sparsity. So um, you might be able to use some of the tools lasso for, you know, trillions of combinations might be useful to users in um, even on the genomic side. So that didn't occur to me until the second saying that, that there may be things that you could use that would be useful on the genomic side too. Great, thank you, George. So anything else that folks think is missing in terms of weaknesses, and then we can go on to opportunities. Anshul? Yeah, so you're just following up on, on uh, sort of Tim's idea of like, this is I think one of the going to be one of the hardest problems in any of these kinds of portals, uh, is search and recommendation um, to be able to do that effectively. Uh, so one thing I was wondering if there is any kind of anonymized logging of how users are putting together different pieces, right? Data with with code, with models, with workflows, because you can imagine that like data has really good metadata and search built in. It's hard to know how to exactly do that for workflows and stuff. But if you connect workflows back to models, the way users actually play with them, you may be able to use the the gigantic metadata you have for the for the data sets to kind of massage how you present 
you know, workflow and so forth. So I'm just wondering if like there is any infrastructure plan to kind of at least have a mechanism to potentially anonymously log like how different parts of you know the entire ecosystem are being used together. The, the same issue will happen for models too. It's very hard to like have some kind of standardized metadata, but like if you hook it all all back up and you have these knowledge graphs and so forth, you could imagine doing very powerful search and recommendation. So just something to think about potentially in the back end. It's a great question, and you know it's something that we're interested in. But you know, like you said, um, there's some there's some really major security considerations that we're really mindful of. And I see yeah. you know, David Burnick's on the call. He's you know kind of our chief um, security officer for all of Anvil here. And to achieve you know this thing called FedRAMP certification, by man, you know we're mandated to have a lot of logging and kind of behind the scenes. Um, uh, accounting of you know who's doing what on the system. So at the very very lowest level, we know you know who's touching what data sets, and we have you know some information about what they're doing. Um, this is I mean I, it's, I'm with you though it's a real tension. At some level, we would love to capture everything and make it anonymous and show it off, but there's some real privacy considerations. So in the here and now, we do not make those generally available. Um, uh, but I agree that that is an important source of metadata. In a different context, in the in some of the, like, say, public servers for Galaxy, we have been mining the metadata about which tools are very popular to make sure that we have good coverage of them inside of the Anvil. So I, I, I kind of see it on, on both sides of, of the spaces. As a research endeavor, it's great to have that information, but for security considerations, privacy considerations, you know, we're, we're kind of on purpose not capturing um, uh, super fine uh, details right now. Yeah, that's a fair char point. Sorry, characterization. Sorry, no. That, 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 I was just gonna say that's a fair characterization. Uh, there, there are times when, when I want to log a lot more for kind of security reasons, and we kind of have this balance, and this is where we we are on it, which is you can run the things, we capture some stuff, we can't capture everything. I completely agree. I think it's a very difficult problem on the security front, but I just wanted to put it out there. The the second comment was like, I think one very useful piece that I think is missing in almost all genomics kind of portals or whatever it is, data portals or these ecosystems is a mechanism for feedback and, you know, public discussion. So like, just like you said, like ranking one, one simple way is to just like, you know, have boats and rank up workflows and tools that people build. So there's, there's an automatic user curated uh, community of these tools, but even better would be having some mechanism like discuss or whatever, like some of these more formal mechanisms where you can provide feedback, like, oh, I think there's a bug in this VR, or like, you know, this, this thing doesn't work for this, right? Having these kind of user commentary is super useful because that feedback can help everybody, including the developers of, of each of these tools. We have both of those. <laughs> you can sort of start workflows to show off if you like them, and then we also have a, um, a discourse where if you want to just sort of generally make comments, I'll put the link in the Zoom chat. Amazing. Okay. So you thought of it already. Great. Great. Anything else on weaknesses or shall we switch to opportunities? So where can Anvil grow and improve? And there are certainly a few discussants who we haven't heard from yet. I won't call you out, but feel free to either comment or raise your hand if you're one of those who tends to stay quiet. All right, Chunwa. Oh, okay, so uh, I think uh, one area that can potentially be extended is this uh, inter uh, interoperability model uh, for Terra. Uh, because I'm looking at this, uh, it has, it defines some data fields such as age, you know, um, uh, but an anatomical site and then all these data fields, but then the, um, it lays no uh, additional data standards to standardize the content of these data fields. They are just the strings. I wonder if additional data standards, either OMAP common data model standards concepts or UMLS or related uh, data standards can be adopted to make sure the content goes into these data fields can be further standardized to enable the uh, interoperability, kind of like enrich and then extend the current Terra interoperability model. It's a great question. I'll just say that the challenge is we're trying to support so many diverse NHGRI consortiums. And I think, you know, within a consortium, 
after maybe some infighting, they can sometimes settle on a standard, but trying to get every consortium that NHGRI participates in to agree on one master standard is a, is a, is a challenge. That being said though, we are, you know, we are pushing and sort of advocating for um, that sort of um, um, uh, developments, you know, to get started, it's sort of free text. As we move forward, I think more and more is gonna be integrated into say fire as sort of just a container. And I like to think that we could, you know, standardize on some of these ontologies, you know, moving forward, but, you know, realistically, it's, it's more of a social problem and getting, you know, all of NHGRI researchers to adopt some of these standards. Mm -hmm. And another thing is to make sure, like when you say age, is that everybody understand is either diagnosis age or current age or what age is referred to. So to make sure all the data contributors, they are kind of putting the same age into that data field. <clears throat> Agree. Mark? Yeah, so my, my impression, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my impression is that most of the Anvil users to date are members of NHGRI funded consortia. And um, it seems to me that an opportunity is, is trying to, to broaden that user base to you know, every R01 PI funded by the NHGRI, or better yet, every trainee on an NHGRI funded training grant. Um, so maybe this, this opportunity goes well beyond just the analysis tools discussion we're having here. But it seems to me that, that that's an opportunity, right, to try and broaden this user base. And I think perhaps some of the challenges that come along with that is that as you get that broadening, you have this growing plethora of tools that people want to bring as well as other data sets, right? Individual investigators wanting to bring their small data sets that they can join with the, the large NHGRI data sets that are currently in Anvil. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps what we should do is to catalog that. So I do think that will come up in the afternoon outreach and training session. But I think in terms of tools, I think you raised a good point, And that is, as the outreach grows to make sure that there is a mechanism for Anvil, the Anvil team to collect what are the tools because there's an opportunity to really expand the tool base as the user base expands. They're going to bring, you know, these are the tools we want to bring to the data that you have. Um, William? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I guess I want to follow up on Mark's uh, comment as well and in, in relates to uh, expanding the footprint. And you can call me Bill. I, I mean, William shows up that most people call me Bill. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I, was, I was wondering, I'm, I'm thinking about that the um, probably the greatest potential for footprint ex extension or expansion probably lies beyond the traditional STEM fields or STEM dis dis disciplines to get a more wide variety. And, and a lot of those uh, uh, students, uh, postdocs or trainees, they may not be comfortable just hearing the uh, standard uh, uh, techie dialogue or uh, they, they may feel that they don't have good access to that, just listening to the conversation. So I was wondering, there may be an opportunity to provide uh, you a tools-based use cases as, as, as entrees to get, to get people in those areas uh, more comfortable and, and understanding how they can really use this to solve some problems that we may have never even thought of because we are not in, in, in that space, but that's, but that's where the actual growth and the impact really is. You know, I mean, I think in my opinion. So, so um, and also when you look at it from that perspective, there's probably an opportunity for tools and outreach to work together, where, where tools can really be a draw uh, in the outreach com community to really expand the, the footprint. So, so I can just summarize like that and just stop right there, I guess. And, and, uh... no, Bill, thank you for that. I think that's very helpful. And I think to, to echo back to what Vince Bonham said earlier today, to increase the diversity of the workforce in this space will require the outreach, but also having the tools available to them. Because I think, you know, for a lot of students, especially in non-computer science disciplines, the idea of, you know, plugging into an API and setting up a whittle is just not something that yeah. they're going to even know what we're talking about. And, and, and that's where the majority of the impact is going to reside. 
beyond the, the, the traditional fields and discipline that we are so comfortable with. That's, right. that's, that's, that's the societal impact going to occur in those uh, disciplines. That's right. We're, we're definitely going to um, continue this discussion in, in the, the breakout session for, for um, outreach and training. So that's just a really great point, Bill. And, and I really want to you know, uh, just highlight um, that, that that was brought up in a different session. So okay. thank you. Thank you. Tim? Yeah, thank you. Um, in terms of analysis, sort of, you know, a lot of the people in, <clears throat> that I work with in my lab, I mean, they are the kind of people that they know enough Unix and Python to be dangerous, but if I also have to get them to learn Google Cloud and a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, little APIs, et cetera, like forget it. They're just they're just not going to engage in in what I think could be some really cool opportunities in terms of using Anvil. Um, and and so the I think there's an opportunity to try to make the interactive environments even sort of easier. And and by that, what I'm meaning is that like. You know, I have this sort of dream that like one of my students could log into Anvil and go to the ENCODE directory and all of ENCODE is there. And then they can just start pulling what they need as opposed to having to, you know, get the Google addresses and, and actually copy that specific piece of data into their workspace. Um, and, and I can imagine the same with GTEx and, and maybe with the right DB guy permissions, even having all of them, you know. So like that, that just, if it could be just that much closer, I think you would be able to get from, You'd be able to pull in the students and the trainees that that um, that aren't in bioinformatics computational programs, um, but know enough to you know to look for features they want across a hundred bed files if those files were all in the same place. Yep, great point, um, Barbara. Yeah, uh, just to uh, sort of uh, echo things that people have said, uh, Bill's point I think is uh, really essential. Tim just made a really good point too. Um, I, I wanted to add um, that some of the data sets that we've been working with recently are um, very heterogeneous in terms of the population. So like not just uh, you know UK or Africa exclusively, but um, sort of uh, uh, broadly admixed individuals, uh, but they're also especially fragile. So. Um, you know, obviously the Million Veterans Project would fall in here. Um, I, I've heard that they're developing a, 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 a what is it called, a football, uh, a, like post uh, trauma uh, database as well. And I definitely work with some, uh, like the Fragile Family Study, which is, uh, you know, uh, underrepresented um, children uh, who uh, are mostly uh, enriched for low socioeconomic status. And none of those, um, databases feel comfortable putting their data uh, up publicly. So I feel like um, uh, the two opportunities we have here is number one, creating essentially a safe space for them where they feel comfortable uh, putting their data up and granting access through you know, a particular granting mechanism, as opposed to all of us just like you know, throwing desktop servers on our, uh, you know, locally at our universities and begging them for the data. Um, but you know, controlled access where it's really, really safe would be great. I think secondly to um, encouraging people to do the right thing with respect to diversity um, it is uh, easy to do when we have the ability to put whatever methods we want on there, right? So, you know, if we if we include methods that allow, you know, highly admixed individuals uh, for for particular types of uh, genome wide association studies and and PRSs, although I know not, they don't necessarily exist for some of these categories, I think that would uh, really encourage uh, people broadly in the community to think more widely about who they. Uh, include in their study? What, what studies they include? Yeah, great points. Thank you. Karen? I just wanted to make a brief comment about a lot of the data sets that we've been discussing so far, these big silo consortium-based data usually are mapped and analyzed in reference to a, a, a single reference genome. And we're about to enter a new era where there are lots of different reference genomes and tools that will allow for a liftover equivalent or something to allow um, increased fluidity between making comparisons between different reference genomes and making new inferences with perhaps genomes that offer more genomic diversity, I think will be really critical for tool development. I suspect there are many consortium efforts, including the HPRC and the T2T consortium, which are building these tools, but having this um, accessible and kind of key to across all the different consortium groups, I think would help unite new discoveries and, and really help across the board. Very good point. Barbara, do you have another point or is that your hand left from before? Okay, just checking.
Any other opportunities? I will, I'll say out loud in case folks are not following aloud, along in the chat, uh, Terry Manolio made a point, and I've heard this statement before, but especially as we think to the future where there would be sets of medical record data in Anvil, being able to search across patient records and find an individual who looks like, you know, uh, the quote is patients like Miss Jones. This is a, a Dan Roden quote. If you've been at a, a genomic medicine meeting with him, you've heard him say this. And that is something I, I think, especially as we think about running machine learning algorithms across electronic health records and identifying interesting, you know, longitudinal patient traje trajectories or just interesting characteristics of patients. You know, one of the things we struggle with is, is this unique or is this a trend? And you want to put it kind of that model against other patients, it, you know, it's hard enough to do that within your own electronic health record data, but being able to do that across sites is very complicated, especially to the earlier point, a lot of, you know, health record data isn't easily shared. And so if there were a way to do something like that in Anvil, that would be amazing. I really like that. At, at the genomics level, we have a good start to this. You know, one of our major components is Gen 3, which takes the, you know, data and metadata and and sort of whatever phenotypes are available at the genomics level. So they can build what we call synthetic cohorts, where it'll be you know, patients or populations of a certain characteristics across many different consortium can all be aggregated together. And I think I see that as an incredibly powerful way to, to take data that we already have and make it more valuable, where it can be re repurposed for different studies. I think that will come in time for you know, health care data um, using fire kind of representations and whatnot. But, um, yeah, I agree. And moving forward, that's going to be an important area of focus. Great. All right, we should probably switch to threats as we're running out of time. So threats here would be, you know, what factors jeopardize Anvil moving into the future? George? Thanks. Um, first, let, let me just point, and I want to talk about complexity as the threat, which we've already talked about. But I mean, that's the big threat, I think. And what, as you build this thing up, it gets more and more complex. The insiders don't see it as so complex because they're used to it, but then new people can never get in because it's just grown in such a way. And we struggle with this in Odyssey with our tool set and how to bring new people in the community that have been that haven't been there from the beginning. So, and you know, there's no easy answer. I mean, what happens is every 10 or 20 years, some savant comes along, throws away all the workshops and focus groups and just knows what to do and does it. So fire. You know, Graham Grieve just said, this is ridiculous after 10 years of RIM. And so we're just going to do this simply. And I know what we need. And he built fire and then people caught on. And now actually fire is getting very complex. So whether there'll be a Graham Grieve 10 years from now that redoes it and does a new simpler thing, I don't know. But every once in a while, you need to like revisit and simplify. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean... It, you know, if I'm honest with myself, it is such a cultural shift, you know, from the way genomics is traditionally done on your own laptop, your own on-premise institutional, to move into a cloud model. You know, in the chat, I see lots of people talking about costs, and I'm totally with you. You know, it's just a cultural shift. There's always been a cost associated with these analysis, but, you know, to put it front and center and really, you know, shine a spotlight on it is, a, is, a, is intimidating. It's terrifying at times. You know, I've had students now click the button where it's, you know, a $50,000 workflow. And it's just a very different experience than, you know, buying a server. You know, it's just, it's very different. What we're kind of, what I, what I see is we're moving into what I call a consumables model, right? It, now, if you want to sequence a genome with, say, Illumina, you know that it's going to cost you, I don't know, a thousand bucks or so. But if we can have sort of that sort of model for popular workflows, it'll be, oh, you know, variant calling will cost you $10 or $5 or, or whatever it is. You know, the, the cost per sample tend to be pretty small. You know, even these days, you know, whole genome assembly, you know, especially with hi-fi data, we're talking, I don't know, $100 or something. It, you know, the individual um, cost per sample is not so high. Now, as we move into studies with, you know, 10,000, 100,000 samples, that's where it adds up. But it's more, in my mind, the cultural shift that the, the way that it's executed, the way that it's paid for is so different. I definitely see that as a threat. It's a, it's a complexity. You know, we're trying to address it at technical levels to make it simpler. We're trying to provide documentation. We're trying to, you know, help people. I'm very pleased to hear what Anshul said that you know, once their postdocs were encouraged, it took them a couple of days um, to figure it out. But I, I'm the first to admit it's a big cultural paradigm shift as we move into this cloud computing. Yeah. 
And I, I just want to echo the the runaway costs, I think, are the scariest part. That happened to me, not in Anvil, but in a different cloud system. We had something run over the weekend that didn't write a file and it was $9,000, but nobody knew it was even running. Like we thought it was dead and then we got this bill. So yeah, the runaway costs, they're real and frightening. Uh, bill. Yes, uh, I just want to add that um, a potential threat could be as this uh, wonderful tool is uh, continually developed as it should be, uh, if there is not a conscientious and unrelenting uh, effort to make this um, available and accessible to people that we may perceive as non-experts, we, we, we have, to, have, to, have to we have to make a conscious effort to bring that cadre of individuals along that cadre of, of investigators alone. And part of that takes, I don't know what that would look like, but we got to think about that. Yep, thank you. Tim? Um, sure, yeah, so I guess on the cost point, part of it is it's really hard to estimate costs. So like, I don't mind if it costs thousands of dollars, but it needs to come from somewhere. And if I can write a grant for that, that's great, but like, you know, if someone asks me how much is it going to cost to, you know, analyze a new data set that you've generated, I don't know, because I don't know how many times I'm going to have to align it. And, you know, that's going to change over time. Right. So um, so I think that that threat can be mitigated, you know, with the right funding models. And maybe there can even be administrative supplements to grants to support that. So for a grant that's already been running for four years, you know, we didn't allocate cloud costs for that. Right. But. Um, so we can't switch to cloud for that because we don't have any funds for it, right? But if there's ways to, um, whether it be um, through supplements, but also through some estimating of anticipated costs to make that easier to write the budgets for grants and to feel confident that that's in the right ballpark for a grant, um, the easier that is to, to, you know, to not worry about so much. Um, so that, that's on the cost front. On the, the, another threat that it just, this is coming up with stuff that's going on at Duke, for example, you know, there's other clouds out there and being very tightly wedded to Google, as it seems, um, you know, I'm worried that there might be other silos building up in other clouds and it's going to be hard to get it into here. Yeah, Tim, that's a, a great point. And that's one that I was just thinking about as as other institutes, as well as other commercial platforms emerge, you know, what what we need to worry about for Anvil in terms of um, interoperability. I mean, just this week, the UK Biobank, for example, their research analysis platform now has 450,000 exomes in DNA Nexus, which is a different platform, which is not necessarily interoperable. And we only have about two minutes left for threats before we go to the kind of summing things up. So I just wanna give a chance. There are a few folks in the discussant group who haven't had a chance to speak yet. Would any of you like to speak up? All right. Anyone else? Anyone who's not a discussant who would like to make a comment about a threat? This is perhaps more in the outreach section, but um, what about onboarding um, like the single user um, researchers? So not groups, not labs, but um, you know, are tools here needed that are um, that they're all like it's it, it's a very expensive process, I guess, to go through as it stands to set up a billing account, get a credit card, get it all approved, just to trial something. Um, and so streamlining that process so that there are like pilot versions of tools available without having to go through the sign up process. I um, mean that that you know they already exist in in their sort of other forms um, to some extent, and they're pulling people away from Anvil. And so are those people ever going to consider Anvil because of that sign-up process? It's um... an interesting point. Well, we're right at about time. Ken, do you 
feel ready to start to go through the, the summary? Yeah, I'm about as ready as I'm going to get. <laughs> so uh, let me share my screen. I'm, uh, let's go. Okay, so I apologize in advance. Can you still see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so what I have, oh, now I have the, I have the, yeah, there we go. All right. So for the strengths, actually, let me get out of this. I may have to make edits to it. So for the strengths, what I had listed was um, docu documentation tools and workflow setups are done very well. Um, data access seems to be a strength for Anvil. Um, the variant interpretation tools and workflows and ease to develop new tools in the workspace was the, considered a strength. Um, the, the plans that are uh, regarding uh, developing third party, to inform third party groups on how to build on the platform was considered another strength. And putting security first in regard to those third party tools and workflow plans was what I had for strengths. So before we go and see whatever I missed, is there anything on these bullet lists that I have that needs to be rephrased if I didn't, I didn't capture it uh, accurately? Okay, is there anything I missed that should be added in this, in this section as a strength? Going once, going twice, all right. So that's what we have for the uh, strengths. I'm gonna go to the weaknesses. Um, what I had listed was developing tools for analysis on open access data sets, um, developing more tools for single cell analysis. There should be, there is an, we, improvements in the documentation related to the access and using doc store. Um, it's hard to find tool, find what tools and workflows people have already developed on Anvil, so improving the curation of those tools and workflows. Um, the interpret, tools for interpretation of SNPs and better annotation, mediation, and Mendelian randomization risk of analysis is, should be is considered a weakness on Anvil. Um, tools that allow for the analysis basis that are built using clinical data models and possibly in actually uh, having uh, algorithms such as BKB uh, ported over to Anvil for analysis, as well as SAM tools. That's the weakness that the Anvil does not have those resources. So that's considered a weakness. Um, mechanism to anonymously log in as an option and improve mechanisms for feedback. So did any of these bullets here need to be rephrased or corrected? Because I, I know I was kind of typing very fast. I may have missed a couple of things. I'm pretty sure I missed several things. <laughs> Okay, is there anything anybody would like to add? Wow, okay, I'm doing pretty well with somebody who has a thumb that has four stitches in it. That's pretty good. <laughs> so for opportunities, work and will grow and improve. Um, this game improvement, adding additional data standards and data models to improve the interoperability for, the Terra, for, for Terra. I need to rephrase that or restate that. Um, Improve the ability to search all available records for matches to an individual patient. I think this is what Terry had highlighted in the chat. Um, improve the ability to link the necessary tools to expand and diversify the Anvil user community. Um, in addition, create a safe space for groups that are hesitant to host diverse data sets in public repositories. So this is what I have for the opportunities. Did I, does any of these bullets need to be revised? Am I missing something that was mentioned that should be included here? I think this is where we said something about, well, I guess it's kind of in the third bullet, this idea of through outreach, we think we'll identify many more tools. I guess that's there. Oh, what about the tools related, uh, um, the opportunity as the more diverse human genetics data sets are available, as well as the um, additional reference genomes that um, having tools that uh, accommodate for or explicitly focus on the admixture and the um, diverse populations. Um, Robert, I just wanted to say also, I, I think the third bullet did capture um, the spirit of what I was trying to say there. 
and, and, and uh, specifically, I'm just using that as an example off the top of my head, sort of like a, a tools-based use cases could, could be a, a way of getting uh, non-experts more involved, and that created an opportunity that, that in the general terms, maybe a, a, a collaboration between the tools uh, uh, and, and outreach can kind of work together for tools to be used as a draw to expand the footprint. All right, hold on one moment. So let me make sure I get the phone. So let me, Bill, I, I have a, I have your, I have a kind of footnote right here, and I'll fill this out. Let me first get to the one about the accommodate the atmosphere of diversity. What was okay. the last part of, of? Could you finish that part? Um, um, diversity of the human genetics data sets and the reference genome. Okay. And just to comment briefly on that point, that's also to ensure backward compat compatibility between the references. So any leftover tools or things that can allow people to move quickly between them would be useful. All right. So Bill, what did you have on yours? Sorry, make sure I capture this. So you were could you could you state that again? I'm sorry, I couldn't capture yeah, that. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I, I I think your bullet certainly captures the spirit of what I was trying trying to say. But I guess specifically, I just suggested that maybe uh, uh, um, if uh, tools-based use cases could be developed, okay. and, and that would be a way of, of uh, introducing or encouraging or making the Anvil platform more accessible uh, to non-expert users. And, and out of that, it seems that a, a general approach could be uh, a, a collaboration between tools and, and, and outreach, where tools could really be the drawing factor to, to really expand the footprint as well. Yeah. But your comment captures the spirit of that thing as well. Okay. This work here. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is what I have for the opportunities. Does anybody want to make changes or add anything to it? One other thing that that I just thought of. Um, that we didn't talk about. I do wonder if there are other tools specifically around genomic medicine implementation that there will be opportunities to house in Anvil. And I'm not entirely sure I know what tools, but I am thinking as more institutions around the country start to implement genomic medicine, certainly, you know, FarmCat is one that we already heard about, but I believe there will be other tools around annotation of um, relevant, you know, clinical genomic variants and pathogenic variants, maybe something around clinical decision support and nudges and the, you know, the build information for those that could be tested or deployed. I, I'm sorry, this is not necessarily helpful as you're typing, but I just, I do think there's going to be opportunity there. I just don't fully know that I know what it is yet. Oh, well, that's fine. That, I mean, we don't have to know. This is this is going to the future. It would be up to us to figure out what those are. Yeah. I mentioned it more when I had the opportunity in the talk, but building off Marilyn's point of just more support for this kind of end to end from a cram to empower people to be able to pull out all the different classes of variants from a clinical perspective, and then yes, figure out how to interpret them and think about reporting them back. So that whole workflow I could I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Mm -hmm. So did I capture this or did I miss or did I miss something just so I'm clear? I just think the idea of like from crams to variants to an right. interpretation is, is kind of the path I'd want to make sure is covered. Okay. And I just want to comment here briefly as well that um, since it was brought up that having tools tailored to the clinical community, it might actually be useful to have kind of a tools um, kind of directed toward the educational space that could support graduate coursework or something along that line to, to implement training with kind of clear cost um, of writing certain tools. And I think that would really address some of the concerns that were brought up in this, this group for outreach too. You want to focus on just graduate training or training in general? I just want to make sure. I, I think it. training in general is appropriate. Yeah. Uh, graduate is an example. And, and I, I might add progress. basic and clinical to that. Basic scientists and clinical researchers. 
And we only have maybe one minute left. So do you want to get to the threats? Yeah. So for the threats, which was reoccurring, I was cloud costs, um, difficulty in facilitating culture shifts to the cloud, challenges in making tools and resources in a manner that meets users where they are, difficulty in making Anvil interoperable with other platforms, and hurdles required to access Anvil just to test the platform. Did any of these bullets, do any of these bullets need to be rephrased because I may not capture them correctly? Did I miss anything that anybody would like to have added to it? Luke? Uh, with respect to the clinical genomics, I just want to make sure that we're considering liability. Okay. Great point, Luke. Thank you. All right. Well, it looks like our breakout room is closing in 40 seconds. Thank you all very much for your input. I think this was really great. Yes, thank everyone for your input. Marilyn, I'm gonna email you this, this, to, this, this deck to you so you can go up and you can present this. Okay, thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for leading the session. Hey everyone, awesome. Uh, welcome to session number two. We'll, uh, we'll hang out just for a second or so. Um, uh, to see if anyone else is going to uh, come into the room. Thanks for putting up the slides, Chris. Um, uh, do we have everyone who we're expecting, or uh, do you think we're waiting on anybody else? We should be good if everyone has come back from the break. Um, do you want me to just do a real brief run through on the intro please, slide? Yeah. Yeah, please, okay. thank you. Okay, happy to do this. So yes, I'm Chris Wellington. I'm one of the co-moderators along with Sid. We'll be doing most of the, the work here during this session. And you've all been in a previous session, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. But um, basically, we're going to have some couple of brief presentations, and we're going to set aside most of the time for discussion. At the end, we're going to try to save a little bit of time to get ready for that report back, like what you just heard from session one. So with that, Stop sharing and over to you, Sid. Oh, actually, if you could keep your slides up, um, okay. let's just let's just go to the uh, next um, one. Yeah, I uh, I was hoping we could uh, just get uh, take a second to just meet our um, discussionists or our, our panelists. Um, I'm from Nashville, so full disclosure, I make everything as a music reference, and uh, you guys are going to be put on the spot. Um, if we could, you guys go ahead and just test it out and unmute yourselves, um, and I just want to hear where you're from. Uh, you know, your, your connection to Anvil um, and, uh, and your favorite musical artist or your favorite artist, but I would say I would say musical artist would be appropriate here. So if we could just very briefly go down the list, if, if you'll indulge me. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cinnamon Blass. I'm from the University of California, San Diego, and I'm actually a brand new member of the external consultant committee. So I haven't had a lot of involvement with Anvil up until this point, but happy to be here today. Favorite, favorite artist, favorite band? Cinnamon? I'm not willing to commit at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Titus, right. Carol, I, I, I guess I'm next. Uh, Titus Brown, I'm at University of California, Davis, um, in the School of Veterinary Medicine. Um, I, I have had long associations with various different part components of Anvil. Uh, and um, I, uh, I also, in addition to doing a lot of training, I also lead the um, training, outreach, and engagement component of the Common Fund Data Ecosystem, which is hoping to interoperate with Anvil and NCPI and all that other stuff. Um, uh, I think the last thing was favorite music. I'll just say uh, um, one of them, Imagine Dragons, works great for long car trips. Great. Carol. Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, Carol Bolt. Um, I'm a professor at the Jackson Lab, and I'm on the Anvil um, ECC group. Um, favorite, uh, I guess it would be a toss up between the Canadian Brass and Serif Brass. I'm a big brass music fan. Awesome, John. Uh, hi, 
Uh, my name is John Quijan. I'm an associate professor at Howard University. We run uh, data science uh, training program over the spring, and then I had the Anvil team supported us and then participated in that, that program. So we were very appreciative for their support and participation. Awesome band. What, what about music? Play? Yeah. John's going to be shy. Go ahead, Andrew. Hi, uh, coming across to you from about six miles from my colleague, John. Uh, I'm Andrew Lee, Northern Virginia Community College, Alexandria, uh, working with Anvil through the GDSCN. So I have been climbing up that steep learning curve of Anvil over the last year or so. And uh, to go with that uh, hometown theme that Sid was talking about, I'm going to pick DC's own Thievery Corporation, kind of good background music if you need to do some work. So Sid's there with me. Yeah. Rob. Hi, I'm Robert Miller. I'm a professor of neurobiology at Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, I run a lot of the genomics projects that go on at Morehouse School of Medicine, uh, which is one of the HBCUs in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and my favorite band would probably be James. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a UK bias there, Rob, but okay. Um, and a Manchester bias as well, but there you go. <laughs> Peter. Dr. Robinson? Okay, chime in if you can. Uh, Saurav. Hi, I'm Saurav Roy from University of uh, Texas at El Paso. I'm assistant prof professor of computational biology. And my link to Anvil is again through GDC and uh, SN like Andrew. And favorite artist is Cliff Richards. Awesome, awesome. And uh, last but not least, Bill. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Bill Sutherland. I'm a professor of biochemistry at Howard University College of Medicine. And I'm also the uh, PI of Howard's uh, RCMI pro program. And uh, I don't have a lot of uh, uh, history, but Anvil primarily through the, the uh, activities that John mentioned, uh, which is a virtual <clears throat> uh, data science training program. 